The Gospel of Luke chapter number 2. Luke chapter number 2 this morning in your Bibles. And for a few moments I want to share something that's been on my heart for a couple of weeks now. Been working on it, studying a little bit, reading a lot, and trying to develop this message today. It's more so from the heart than anything else. And um, just through some, some observation that I have acquired over the years of pastoring, that we find this message embedded in my heart today. I want us to read here from Luke chapter number 2. I know most of the time we go to Luke 2 in the first part concerning the birth of Christ. We're going to look at the last part of this chapter. And there's something that's quite interesting here in this text of Scripture uh, that I, I think will be helpful to us today and also a great challenge. Look with me, if you would, beginning of verse number 40. Verse 40, Luke chapter 2, verse number 40. Luke 2, verse number 40. The Bible says, And the child grew, waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Speaking none other of Christ, none other than of Christ, okay? Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey. And they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Several things to point out in the text of Scripture here that uh, kind of struck me. We'll say more about them in a moment. I like the fact that Verse 40, that the child grew, he waxed strong in spirit. Doesn't say he was out lifting weights. He said he waxed strong in spirit. Oh, that'd be an admirable thing to have today. Is more people becoming stronger in spirit. I like also the last verse that I read to you. He increased in wisdom and stature. It just means he grew. At that time, he was 12 years old. But he was astounding the doctors and the lawyers in the synagogue, wasn't he? That's, I think that's pretty cool. Here's a 12-year-old. How many of y'all 12-year-old? Anybody here 12-year-old? Hey, y'all, y'all be smart. Y'all could be smart. Now, how many of y'all act like you're 12 years old? Don't raise your hand. Twelve years old, and Jesus was astounding the doctors, the lawyers. When we would say doctors and lawyers, they were doctors of the law. They were those that were scribes, Pharisees, and such that, uh, that uh, prided themselves in knowing the law of the Old Testament. So what does this have to do with our message today? Well, we'll get to that part here in just a moment, but I need to... I wanted to read the text of Scripture. I want you to keep in mind something about Jesus in the text. There was a three-day period 
in which Joseph and Mary had no idea where he was at. Three days. The first day, they missed him completely. But after three more days, or three days, they finally found him. Now, I've got a question I want to ask. And this is the message this morning. The question of the message is where is Jesus in your life? How long would it take for him to be missing for you to take notice? Here's a great fear of mine. He's missing in some of your lives and you don't know it. He's missing in some of our lives and we don't care. That's even more dangerous. I just, I just want to ask the question this morning. Probably about a month ago, this question popped in my mind, my heart. I was like, oh, wow. So I began to ask myself that question. Where is he at in my life? More and more Christianity is being forced, being pushed to silence. Every day, something's going on or something's happened to where the truth of Christianity, the truth of biblical knowledge, the truth of, of wisdom that we can find in the Word of God is being forced out. It's becoming actually more aggressive. The more that we object to the pushing of Christianity out of our lives, the more aggressive they become in forcing it away from us. They would like nothing more than to silence every God-fearing person, every Bible-believing church in this world. There are some in other parts of the world. Did you understand that? I know of some. I've been in some in other parts of the world. I've been in some in Brazil and Russia and Cambodia that are preaching the truth. And they would like nothing more than to silence them as well. Right now, we're talking about Americans, and we're talking about American churches, and more specifically, I'm talking about this church. Doing the right thing is only relative to what a person thinks is right for themselves. Well, that's become a norm. And when it comes to thinking about Jesus, Jesus is only relative to who thinks that he is worthy of our thoughts. And now that sometimes that becomes questioned, even, among, even in churches and even among people who, who say, I'm a believer, who say, I'm a Christian, and yet you don't want to think about Christ? You don't want to talk about Jesus? Can I just remind everybody that he is still king of kings? He's still Lord of lords? And you have the option. You've got an option to where you can bow your knee today in today's world, and, and before he comes back, you can bow before him today and confess him as Lord, or you will one day. Amen. And, and that's an option. My suggestion would be, I, I want to do that now. I want, I want to make him Lord of my life now. I want to make him king of my heart now. I don't want to wait until my, my dying day. We can't afford to wait till it's too late. The corruption of minds and hearts has lost sight of the place of Jesus Christ in our lives. We're being corrupted every which way we turn. <clears throat> I want to elaborate on a couple of things. And I know that this is not popular, but it's needed. The media in every sense of the word, whether it's the media that you find on national networks or social media junk, garbage, that floats around on the airwaves and on your phone, and most everybody in here has probably got some of the junk on your phone already. They're pushing a narrative right now that is so corrupt, and it's pushing your mind away from Jesus Christ. And until you recognize it and do something about it, it is not going to change. The narrative that they're pushing is not decent. 
It's not wholesome. It's not righteous. It's not godly. It's negative against anything that has anything to do with God. It's negative about anything that is decent. Do you remember back in the day, some of you were older, you remember back in the day when certain things were taboo. You don't talk about that. You don't look at that. You don't see that. You, 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 you wipe your mind clean of those things. And now today it's like we laugh at everything. <clears throat> if we look in Scripture, this is uh, something, I find something extremely similar in the book of Genesis in chapter 3. Y'all know what happened there? All right, first three rows. Somebody tell me what happened in Genesis chapter 3. One of y'all tell me what happened in Genesis chapter 3. I'm sorry? The fall of man. Thank you so much. In Genesis chapter number 3, there was a, a being by the name of Satan who was very subtle. And he, he made two statements. And those two statements changed the course of the world and caused sin to take place on every man, woman, boy, and girl. It changed the narrative of Eve's mind. He, he did those things that destroyed, uh, what he said actually destroyed the relationship between God and man. And those two sentences that he presented placed doubt, it presented confusion, and it propagated a lie. Does that sound familiar to you? Sounds like the same thing that's happening with our media today. They are placing doubt they are causing confusion and they're propagating a lie. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Is that, I, there's actually nothing decent, honorable, wholesome, righteous, or godly about any of it. And what Satan did was horrible. That's why we have death. That's why we have sin. That's why we have the mess that we're in now. Let me go a step further. I'm going to go one step further. I could go many, many steps, but I'm going to try to limit it to just one more step. Just to show you what's going on, and then we're going to come back to that question. What does this have to do with the question at the very beginning? It has everything to do with the question at the beginning. Because if Jesus was in your life, you wouldn't listen to the garbage. If Jesus was in our life, we'd, we'd, we'd probably do more about it. If Jesus was in our life, we would stop it from taking over our families. One more thing. <clears throat> and this one has just really hit a nerve with me. Okay? And listen to my words carefully. I know I said something about this last Sunday night or so on, uh, you know, because we're talking about the home and blueprints for a dream home. We're talking about the family. We're talking about moms and dads and culture and all those things that are going on, okay? But I have to insert this because, <clears throat> you know, if Jesus was in, uh, yeah, if Jesus was in your life, you'd, you'd, want, you'd want to hear all of it, but, you know, I, I, my fear is that he's not there, and so you could care less whether you want to have a dream home or not. I, I ain't getting ugly. I'm just I'm getting downright nasty. <clears throat> I mean, do you really want Jesus to be in your home? You want him to be in your life? Do you want him to take control and, and, and help you with the situations that are going on? Because listen, I'm telling you, moms and dads, listen, the governmental educational system. Now look, I know we have some educators in our church and this has no reflection on them because I know them and I know their heart and I know they want to teach the right thing. But overall, in general, and I think that they would agree with me on this, that overall the governmental educational system that they are pushing right now now is demented. It's against traditional biblical values. It's against what the Bible teaches us about history. Trying to change our history. They're trying to change science. They're trying to change biology. You can't change biology. 
trying to change astronomy. They're even trying to change the language. I told you all about that, didn't I? I ain't capping. I know some of y'all confused right now. What in the world did our preacher just say? Now see, if you'd have been here a couple of weeks ago, you'd have understood that. I need to explain it, don't I? Because some of y'all are going to go away from here. Man, the preacher done lost his mind. You know, you know used to, when I grew up, a cap was a, well, you put it on top of a bottle. Yeah, you, you, you had to pop open the cap in order to drink that good glass bottle of Mountain Dew. Had the little guy on there in his hat, and he's like, Woohoo, Mountain Dew. <laughs> or, or a cap was, you get a cap pistol. And, and you could put the, the roll of caps in there and do one at a time and bang, bang. Not, no, no, that, that's just not the Haskett way. You get a roll of cap and a hammer. And you do all of them at one time. You get a bigger bang. You cap it. And then things begin to transpire. I'm talking about the way they change in language. And then, you know, a few years ago, it was, you know, some, some areas of our world and our, our, our country and all that, you go to some portions of town, they're going to bust a cap in you. Which means you're going to get shot. Well, see, all that's changed now. Now, capping means no lie. I ain't lying. I don't know how we got from the top of a bottle of Coke or good Mountain Dew to a cap pistol to shooting to now. I ain't lying. That's what it means. I ain't capping. I ain't lying to you. I don't understand why you just can't say I ain't lying to you. Everybody knows what, about, what that means. What I'm saying is the, the educational system, and, and we all know this, I think that we're aware of this, that the, the teaching of the Bible has become unimportant and obsolete. Let me explain something to you. Every person in here, listen to me. The Bible is of extreme importance. If you do not teach the Word of God to your family, to your kids, in your home, in everybody that you come in contact with, we're going to lose. We're going to lose Jesus altogether. And He will not be a part of anybody's life or any culture for that matter. The masses of people are being told it just doesn't matter what the Bible says in the book of Genesis. Oh, yes, it does. The very first verse is so important. In the beginning, God. If they can corrupt the minds about Genesis 1, 2, and 3, then they're going to corrupt the minds about salvation. And the minds about everything else. I do think that we've come to the place that people in our churches think that Jesus, in His place, and the truth about Him has become so unimportant. Do you think the virgin birth is important? The, the thing that we need to answer, though, is why the virgin birth is so important. We talk about it. We mention it. I preach it. I know that you've heard it. We do it. We do it at Christmas. We talk about how important the virgin birth is. We know why. Does your children know what that means? Do they know that he, uh, he had a sinless life? That he had a perfect ministry? That his death was substitutionary? That his resurrection was glorious? That his ascension was phenomenal? Do they know all of those things? It's all about Jesus. And if we have got to get to the place where we are continuously pushing Jesus. He's not obsolete. He is more important today than he's ever been in the history of mankind. Now, I'm debating whether to say this next thing, but you know what? I'm going to go ahead. I done... Society teaches that uh, 
participation is so valuable. And everybody's a winner. That ain't true. Not everybody's a winner. Somebody's going to lose. Oh, but it, it teaches them. Oh, come on. You see, here, here's what that does. That, that whole concept teaches them against what the Bible says. Proof, Romans chapter 3, verse 10. There is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, do you think sinning is winning? No, sinning is losing. Do you think hell is winning? Hell is not winning. Hell is a big fat losing. So why are we teaching? See, that, that's the, the subtle narrative that our world teaches is, is that everybody's a winner when in reality not everybody is a winner. Not everybody's going to go to heaven. I wish everybody would and God is not willing that any perish but that all would come to repentance. That's why he sent his son to die for us. That's why that if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ we can be saved if we would put our faith and trust in him. But if we don't do that then we are losing because we're going to wind up in a place called hell. We don't have a problem teaching the proper way to swing a bat, throw a ball, shoot a basketball, kick a soccer ball, football. But then when it comes to teaching Jesus, we got issues. Look, there's nothing wrong with ball. I know what it's like to be on a state championship basketball team. Yeah. But that wasn't a priority. You know what my dad taught me? He said, you can play a ball as long as it don't interfere with church. It worked for me. You know who else it worked for? My two boys. But there was a tournament game on a Wednesday night. Didn't matter. Did not matter. Talked to my oldest son about that tournament game Wednesday night. You going to miss the game? I'm going to church first. He missed the first half of the game. But his teammates left the locker door open on the outside of the gym where he could walk in at halftime, get dressed, and nobody knew it except his teammates and us. Did they win? It didn't matter. He gained the respect of the coach and the players because he put the priority first. Now, here's, here's my question. Here's my question. Where's Jesus in your life? You see how this connects? With, with the stuff going on in our media, with our educational system, and we could name a number of things, and I'm not going to go down that road because I need to really get to the message this morning. You know, there's nothing wrong with having those skills, nothing wrong with having skills, be able to shoot a ball, swing a bat, kick a soccer ball. I mean, wonderful. I'm, I'm proud. I'm, I'm tickled. Our young people have a great time in the gym playing Jeremy ball, don't you? See, it takes all those skills. I know some of y'all saying, what in the world is Jeremy Ball? You, you just have to see it. <laughs> Understand that the youth pastor's name is Jeremy. <laughs> he created the game. And I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> so here's my question. Where's Jesus in your life? Now, I really don't know from this point how much further I need to go. 
been struggling. If the Lord's going to change it or not. If, I don't know. But I really need everybody in here today to think about where's Jesus in my life. You need to ask yourself that question. I'm trying to give it to you as God put it in my heart. So I ask you the question from the, from the pastoral preacher point of view. Where's Jesus in your life? If he's not there, he needs to be. In fact, he wants to be. He wants to be there in your life. He wants to be a part of your life, but you won't let him. There's some kind of resistance or some kind of hindrance that's going on and you keep him at a distance. You stiff arm him. That's as close as I want you to get right now, Jesus. I don't want you any closer. I might have to do something. Where's he at? Oh, uh, Joseph and Mary, they went a whole day. Didn't even know he was gone. I wonder how long, how long is it for you? How long does Jesus have to be gone from your life before you recognize it? Oh my. He's not here. And I need him. And when you begin to search for him, does it take another two days? I know the reality of this story. I know that we're talking about the physical body of Jesus. And I know we're talking about physically Joseph and Mary and a place called Jerusalem and their town and their family and their acquaintances. I know we're talking about all of that. But I'm talking now, right now, today, 2021, July the 11th. Where is Jesus in your life? Let me give you a couple of things. When it comes to recognizing his authority, where's Jesus in your life? That's number one. When it comes to recognizing his authority, where is Jesus in your life? Over in Matthew 28. The Lord had told the disciples, he said, guys, I'm going away. Now, this is obviously was after his death, his burial, his resurrection. His, he's, he's meeting with them one more time. And he's giving them instruction. He's, in, in fact, the, the Great Commission follows here. And Jesus said to his disciples, he said, guys... All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Do we rec really recognize the power that Jesus has? The authority? The word power there means his influence. It means his choice. Ability to make choice. His ability to make decisions. The privilege that he has. In a relationship with Jesus Christ, would it not be to our advantage to recognize the one who has all power and all authority? There might be a need in our lives that requires some divine authority and a choice or we need Jesus to, 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 to intervene because we need his influence and we don't want or we don't need anything whatsoever to hinder God's choice or God's influence. So where's he at? 
John chapter 11, I'm sorry, John chapter 19, verse 11. In a conversation that Jesus had with Pilate, Pilate made the bold statement. He said, don't you realize that I have the power to take your life? And Jesus responded this way. He said, no. Thou couldest have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Which simply means, you know what, I've got all the authority. That's what Jesus was saying. Do we recognize the fact it's only Jesus that can forgive sin? I've watched people try Buddha. Buddha doesn't work. And some are trying Muhammad and he don't work. He's dead. Only Jesus can forgive sin. There, there was a time, there was a time in which Jesus, there was a guy who was sick of the palsy. He was paralyzed and, and he couldn't walk. And so he asked the scribes and Pharisees, which, which, what's easier for me to say? Rise up and walk or to forgive him of his sin? <laughs> you know what he did? Both. He said that in Mark chapter 2, verse 10. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Let me ask you again, where's Jesus in your life? It's Jesus alone that commands the unclean spirits. Well, that happened numerous times in the text of Scripture. One in particular, Luke chapter 4, verse 36. The Bible says this, And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this! For with authority and power He commanded the unclean spirits, and they come out! You know where the guy was that had the unclean spirit? You read the story. He was in the synagogue, the place of worship. Can I put it in modern day terminology? He was at church. He was at church and had an unclean spirit. But you know what Jesus did? He took care of business. Let me ask you, where's Jesus in your life? When it comes to recognizing his authority, let me mention this one. Where is Jesus when it comes to remembering his ability? Do you remember what he's done in the past? See, sometimes we forget what Jesus has done in the past. We were all fired up and excited whenever we first get saved and then something happens. We start losing our mind. Jesus starts to fade away. We begin to wash our hands and we, 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 we kind of let things build up and we hinder. Maybe we, we got our feeling hurt. Hey, you're a human being. You're going to get your feelings hurt. Both of them. But that does not Take me away from the person of Jesus Christ. Yeah, did you hear what I said? So where is he at in your life? If he was in the place that he needed to be in your life, you'd go on. Does not our Bible say that we should forgive? I know it's hard sometimes. People have this great tendency to always remember the negative. It's much more challenging to remember the positive, isn't it? Amen. Well, well, what about the good things? Well, what about the good memories? What about those positive things? I know some will say, well, I don't have any. Yeah. So where's Jesus in your life then? Remembering His ability... Mark 4, 41 says this, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Remember that day? Can I just remind you that 
history, his story, this book of the Bible. Okay, right here. All of you have got one currently with you. He alone, he alone can raise the lame or the dead. Doesn't matter to him. He alone can rebuke the sea or the demons. It's he alone that can restore sight or the health to the sick. It's, it's him alone that can remove leprosy or the guilt of sin. It doesn't matter to him, but it's wherever you put him in your life. So let me ask you the question, where's Jesus in your life? I, I, I want to mention this one quickly, last thing. When it comes to respecting his admonition, where is Jesus in your life? Now, the word admonition simply means warning. So when God gives you a warning, where is he at? What do you do with it? Um, Matthew chapter 16. I'm going to turn here. I'm going to read a couple of verses to you. Matthew chapter 16 verse 21 says this. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. So he's told them all of this. I want you to watch what Peter does. Listen to what Peter does. Verse 22, Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Whoa, 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 whoa. Back to truck up a minute. Peter has forgotten who has all authority. Peter has forgotten the ability. Peter has forgotten. Peter! Hey, Pete! Don't you remember when you were sinking down in the water, it was Jesus that lifted you up? Peter begins to rebuke the Lord. And the Lord said these words. Listen carefully. In verse 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Mm. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So let me ask you a question. Where's Jesus in your life? When he gives you a warning... Do we do like Peter? Do we begin to rebuke the Lord for his warning? See, I got this kind of this suspicion today that some of y'all are going to walk out of here and say, My goodness. I don't want no part of that. That preacher was mean today, talking about all this stuff. All I'm trying to do is find out where Jesus is in your life. That's all he wants to find out. I've actually spent a couple of mostly sleepless nights thinking about this message. Went to bed with it on my mind. Woke up with it on my mind. Sleep a couple of hours here and there. Where's Jesus in your life? Whew. When God gives us a warning, what do we do with it? Let, can we continue on in that text? You're there in Matthew 16? Hang on, let me dry my eyes so I can... Read it. Verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. Watch this next verse. For what is, it, man, what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? This book, you've heard it this morning a couple times. It warns us about the dangers of sin, doesn't it? I've told you what happened in Genesis 3. I've shared with you Romans 3, 10 and 23. Sin, it's a problem. And it's a problem in all of our lives. And, and, and don't think, I'm not naive. Every person in this room is a sinner. 
no one in this room is self-righteous. And I've got this idea, maybe that's why God has put my heart so heavy, that sometimes we miss Jesus in our life. We'll go a day or two or three, and He's not even close. So where's He at? The Bible warns about sin. Do we respect His Word? When God warns us about the influence of Satan, stay away from the stuff that's satanic. Our young people, I've tried to warn you even about our young people, parents, and listen, we have got to get a hold of this situation in our own country and in our own homes. Because satanic influence is going to ruin their lives. If it hasn't already. So where's Jesus in your life? Right now is not the time to abandon the Lord. It's not time to forsake Him. It's not time to quit. It's not time to give up. It is not time to say, I don't want to have anything to do with Jesus. You need Him more than ever right now. Hey, God help us. God help us. To know where Jesus is right now. Father, we love you. Oh, Lord, we thank you. Thank you for meeting with us and thank you for your help this hour. Thank you for sensing your presence. It is impossible. For this service, this message, or anything of the like to, to be, uh, have any kind of accomplishment or any kind of influence without your help. Lord, I pray for every heart. May we search into the depths of our soul to see where you're at. And if you're missing, Lord, please help us to find you. Speak to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our heads still bowed, please. Ah. Uh. So where's he at? So where's Jesus in your life right now? Now is not the time to remain in your seat if there's a need. Now is not the time to keep Jesus hidden or missing in your life. Now's not the time. So what time is it, preacher? Time to come on. Come on. The Lord spoke to your heart this morning. Where's he at? Where's Jesus? Where's he at in your life? Come on. I know he's spoken to hearts. I can tell It may not necessarily be you, but maybe somebody in your family. It may be some situation that you're going through. Where's Jesus in that? Where's he at? You know, he's not going to be there to help if we don't call on him, if we don't ask him, if we don't seek him out and search for him. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Many have come, and I, I invite you to come. The altar is open. I want you to use it as God does, gives you direction today. So let me ask you a couple of questions. 
And for those of you at home, I want you to listen and pay attention also to the questions today. How many would, can honestly say with an uplifted hand, Pastor, no question in my heart or my mind if something happened to me. I know right where Jesus is, and I know that if I died, I know I'd go to heaven. No doubt in my heart. Can you raise your hand? No doubt. No doubt. No doubt. Thank you so much. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Is there anybody here today in this service or watching online that would raise a hand in honesty and say, Pastor, I'm not sure about heaven. I know I don't want to go to hell, but I'm not sure about heaven and I need you to pray for me. Would you slip that hand up and allow me to pray for you, anyone? Anyone at all? So where's Jesus in your life? For those of you that are home, we want to be a help to you. There'll be some information on your screen. You can reach out to us. Any, any of those means possible. by, and, and we'll answer you promptly. If you need someone to pray with, you'll be more than happy to do that. If you need some some scripture shared with you, be happy to do that. Whatever the need is, be more than happy to be a help to you. Our main goal is to glorify the Lord, but also for you to see Jesus. I hope and pray that He is in your life today. Thank you so much for watching.